I turn off the TV. And then he just says that. He's like, I, I kill a woman, that's what he said. The woman you just saw is Isabel Ponce Lara, a police officer and the wife of Edwin Lara. He said something that he hit her with the car and then he panicked. A few days after this interrogation, authorities made a grim discovery in Sisters in Redmond, Oregon, the body of 23 years old Kaylee Sawyer. Kaylee Sawyer was brutally killed in Oregon. Meticulous police examination exposes harsh reality, stirring community uproar and prompting a relentless pursuit of justice. She carried a smile and she carried love. Killed me, I'm gonna be the head of the heart. Edwin's account began with the stark admission of believing he'd committed a murder. Yet, as the story progressed, it revealed a darkness far beyond the mere act itself. Before July 2016, Kaylee Sawyer was leading the typical life of a college student. She was enrolled at Central Oregon Community College, balancing her studies with a part-time job as a dental assistant at Opry Dental. Living close to campus with her boyfriend, Cameron Riemhofer, she harbored dreams of a promising future. However, the course of her life took a tragic turn on July 23rd, 2016. That evening, Kaylee had been celebrating at a bachelorette party in downtown Bend. As the festivities wound down and the clock neared midnight, Kaylee, under the influence of alcohol, reached out to Cameron for a ride home. But a heated exchange of text messages ensued, leaving her frustrated and upset. In a moment of impulse, she decided to walk home alone, navigating the darkened streets of Bend. As she strolled near her college campus, Kaylee's path intersected with Edwin's. Sadly, that night marked the last time anyone saw Kaylee. She has four, four younger brothers who desperately want their big sister home. The following day, when Kaylee didn't respond to any calls or messages, Cameron grew increasingly worried. Unable to locate her or get in touch with anyone who had seen her since the party, he reached out to her friends and family, but no one had heard from her either. Fearing the worst, Cameron dialed 911, hoping for help in finding Kaylee. Last night I got home from the bars with my girlfriend. She got upset at me and ran off. Mm -hmm. And I chased her and wasn't able to find her, and I still haven't heard from her. Her phone's off. I called all her family and they haven't heard from her, so I'm wondering what you recommend I do. We can put in a call and we can uh, have officers and deputies. Uh, look for. Cameron relayed to the 911 dispatcher that the last known location of Kaylee was near the college campus. She's got her phone with her. Uh, she did last I saw her, but it's been dead all day and what the f imagine she would charge it. Does she go to like, like a job that she needs to be out that she missed or anything or anything like that? Not today. She has work tomorrow at Aubrey Dental. Okay. And any diagnosed mental or uh, physical health issues? No, none that I know of. The police launched an urgent and frantic search for Kaylee, scouring every corner in hopes of finding any trace of her. Law enforcement's initial suspect was Cameron himself, but Kaylee's family declined to pursue this line of inquiry. However, as the search intensified, Kaylee's mother made sure to inform the authorities about her daughter's medical history, ensuring that they treated the case with the seriousness and urgency it deserved. Dispatch, how can I help you? Yes, I need to have an officer call me. Um, my daughter is missing, and she is over 23, but she has um, um, epilepsy and some medical issues. In an unexpected twist, the situation took a dark turn. Edwin's wife, Isabel, was quietly watching TV when she noticed her husband's tear-filled eyes, a look of fear and shock etched on his face. Concerned, she pressed him for an explanation, but Edwin was flustered and confused. With Isabel's persistence, Edwin found himself unable to keep his secret any longer, and in a moment of confession, he revealed the truth to his wife. The tale of Kaylee's disappearance took yet another unexpected turn. After Edwin confessed to Isabel, she found herself grappling with a decision. After careful consideration, Isabel made a surprising choice. She resolved to go to the police and reveal everything she had learned from her husband. It was a pivotal moment in the ongoing investigation, shedding new light on the mystery surrounding Kaylee's fate. So he comes out of the room and his eyes were all teary. 
that's why I'm like, what happened? Tell me what happened. What, what's wrong? So he sits on the sofa, I turn off the TV, and then he just says that. He's like, I, I kill a woman, that's what he said. I'm like, he said, I don't remember exactly the words that he said, but he said something that he hit her with the car, yeah. and then he panicked. Okay. So then I asked him, like, that's what I was trying for him to explain to me. So you hit her with the car, that's an accident. Yeah. Why? What do you mean you panic? What, what do you mean? The weight of Edwin's words bore down on her like a heavy burden, shaking her to the core with a mixture of shock, disbelief, and heartbreak. And then he's like, then he said, okay, so then he says, at some point, I don't remember, it was back in the living room or whatnot, because he was just walking back and forth. He said that he hit her with the car, the car at work. And I asked him, well, where is there any sign that you hit her or what? And then he said that it was because of the grill, that no, there was no signs. It was just him moving around. I'm not sure if he, I don't think he grabbed anything other than he did grab my gun from my purse. And then he just kept saying, I, I need to go, I need to go. And then right before he left, he's like, there's her stuff in the shed. He's how did he say, say that again? He, did, he said something in regards to there's, her stuff is in the shed. Her stuff is in the shed. Law enforcement swiftly initiated efforts to trace Edwin's whereabouts. Their search led them to Edwin's residence, where they discovered crucial evidence despite his absence. Among the findings were belongings linked to Kaylee, further deepening the investigation. After departing from his residence, Edwin was reportedly sighted near an Oregon motel the following day, accompanied by another woman. Prior to this, he had also streamed a live video on Facebook. Hi everybody, um, I just want to say that I apologize for everything I've done. Most likely I'm going to get caught. And, um, uh, Sorry about that girl, about that girl in Central Oregon, and I just want to let family members, uh, Andrea, that she's fine and she will be fine because uh, so far she's been doing uh, what I've been going to do, you know, and, and if you guys are wondering uh, if I have done dirty things to her, no. All right, I'm not that kind of guy. You know, I just, you know, I used to kill that other girl, you know, and I regret it. I regret killing her. You know, she kept screaming and I just thought her forever. So, you know, like I say, she's still fine. We're driving and she'll be home pretty soon. I'm sorry to her grandma and her family members, to her boyfriend. You know, I'm sorry for everything that I caused. Okay, and you'll see her pretty soon. Okay, tell the cops that not to shoot us, because if they shoot us, then that's not my fault. Okay, but sorry, everybody. Following the live stream, Edwin placed a 911 call. 911 emergency reporting. Yes, hi. This is Edwin Lara, and I'm the guy on Interstate Interstate 5, going at high speed. I, I know you guys have the chopper on me already. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I just want to say I am going to turn myself in. Okay, where are you at? Okay, I'm on I-5, uh, I think close to Reading, if I'm right. So... You know, I, I am wanted for murder in the state of Oregon. Okay. Edwin, yeah. where are you at right now? Can you stop? I am going to stop once I head Reading. Once I'm in Reading, I'm going to stop. Okay, can you tell me where you are right now? I have no idea. Okay. Uh, oh, let's see. There's a sign right here. 50 miles from Reading. You're 50 miles from Reading. Wait, wait, wait. Corn, Corning. From Corning. Edwin was eventually located on a highway in California. You got me? Trap. 
face. Drop down to your knees. Don't move. Go ahead. Shortly afterward, police brought Edwin in for questioning. We have not been able to find Kaylee's body. Can you please uh, help me find her body immediately before we start talking about anything else? Oh. The reason why I'm asking you that is uh, I've done this a bunch of times. I want to tell you where the body is. Yeah, I do. But I want to get on first. Okay. So here's what I know about this. Hear me out, sir. Uh, we can't change what happened, the three of us in this room. And people will care more about what happens right now than what happened before. So um, we know that you've been talking to some people, et cetera, et cetera, right? And because we have different jurisdictions, I can assure you that right now the DA's office is working on allowing us to take you back to Oregon. Okay. Nevertheless, Kaylee's body remained undiscovered, emphasizing the urgency of locating her remains as a top priority. Uh, we need to consider some things, okay? If this information gets to other people that uh, you were like, hell yeah, I'm going to tell you, but only until I get what I want, they might uh, try to think of this about something different than what it is, right? And so um, what I've determined is, and we've looked at this a bunch of times, I don't think you're a bad guy, right? I think that things have spun completely out of control, sir. Sir, am I right? Okay. But that being said, you know from your training and your education that we have a massive load of resources right now dedicated to one thing, and that's to serve the victim's family, okay? And they need that. And they need that right now. And so I need you to remember that it doesn't matter so much about what happened as what you do now. The detectives are indeed on the right track, steadily pursuing leads to unravel the mystery surrounding Kaylee's disappearance. Edwin began to confess in writing, detailing his involvement through a series of notes. All right, check the box. We're gonna get somebody to get you out of this, man. I mean, uh, oh. So that's Highway 126. 126 Highway. Mm -hmm. That's going towards Sigma. Correct. Do you know that the Shoots River? The Shoots River. That's okay, Shoots are we River. closer to Redmond? Closer to Redmond. Mm -hmm. Okay, so about, I'm thinking maybe not even 10 miles. Let's keep going. Okay. There is a mailbox right here. It's going to be on the uh, south side of the road. So if this is north, like the. Uh, yeah, it's north, it's going to be on the south side. Okay. Surprisingly, Edwin was forthcoming, confessing to everything without hesitation. How far off the highway? Uh, I see it's right there. You'll see it right away. It says you'll see it right away. Buried in the ditch. Is it buried or it's not buried? It's not just okay. in the ditch itself. It's just in the ditch. Okay, it's outside of the highway across from that mailbox. Correct. It appeared that the detectives appreciated Edwin's cooperation and willingness as it significantly aided their investigation. I'm, I'm thankful to you. I want to say that right away that you hear what this man has to say and that you've got a heart inside of you. And I know because I was in your house, I saw the Bible, I know you thumbed through it a lot. I see that you've tithed for months consecutively. Um, I know you're, you, you have God in your heart. Okay. And that's just not a trick. That's eternal, right? You know that, but I'm not talking about this moment I'm talking about the big picture. Okay. And so I appreciate your honesty. So what happened, man? What happened? The, like the straight up what happened? So I was putting the signs up where there was an event going on. I said, call it college. Cyclist, you know, I was in a hurry because I want to get out of here. And I was going to turn south on College Way 
on the D4 lot. So I was going to turn south on the do not enter area there. And I didn't see her. She was wearing all black. Edwin claimed that he was in a hurry that night, so he didn't see Kaylee standing on the road. And I wasn't expecting anybody, you know, at that time of night, so I just turned and, and I, I mean, I didn't hit her that hard. I just bumped her with the, the patrol car, bumped mm -hmm. her with the front rack. And she fell down. And at first I thought, you know, first thing I was, oh, I killed her, you know, but I didn't hit her that hard. So I got off the car and she was really drunk. And then she looks at me and then she started screaming. She started screaming at you. She did. He claimed that he had no bad intentions, but the situation took a horrifying twist. So I panic and I just grab her little throat and told her, shut up, shut up, shut up. So she passed out, put her on the back of the patrol car, drove her up the B12 lot. And then I was panicking, I didn't know what to do. She already seen me, she saw my face. <clears throat> so I opened the door, and that's when she came back. She started screaming again. So I grabbed the truck home. And I was telling her, shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up. She was just struggling to scream. So I threw her down and I had over a rock on the head. In the meantime, Edwin disclosed some disturbing information. To that, I dragged her body <clears throat> behind a tree there, and I had over another rock. And that's when I think she died because I heard her breathing. Her last breath. And then with her body there, I went to the zombie gym. I tried to wash off all everything, all the dirt from my coat. I had a stain on my shirt. I was wearing the bike shirt, the bike patrol shirt. I had a red stain. I couldn't take that off, so I started washing my pants and my boots on the Mizama gym. I went into the men's restroom right in front of the main entrance of the south south entrance of Mizama. Then after being there, I just walked towards the women's gym or shower. And I went into the shower and I started washing off all the dirt in my pants. And then I looked at the watch and it was like, 150 or whatever and my shift was almost over the detective had a gut feeling that there were hidden layers to the story so they pressured him so what happened next so i drove her to a ditch by uh, close to my parents house and we, she was kind of heavy, you know, so I just grabbed her and pretty much ripped everything off her, like her pillow, I threw her in the ditch, and then I went back home and I was like, okay, they got to find her there pretty quick, so I got to put her, got to move her and put her somewhere else. There. Eventually, he began describing everything in detail. She's playing everything. And I know that most likely I will die in prison, you know. And that's going to be one of the things that I'm going to take in my heart. And the regret of killing this girl. And I know this is being recorded and apologize to the parents. To the dad, I know the dad has been looking for her nonstop. I apologize. She'll be pretty nice girl. 
she didn't deserve what I did. So, but <clears throat> one day after I moved her body, the second time, or the first time, the second time, she said, um, I woke up with this thing in my heart, like heavy, you know. And At that moment, the detective's reactions intensified. So a couple things you need to understand, and we're finally getting to the real problem here, we really are, is you knew she was never getting out the car the moment you shut that door. Well, let me finish. You need to let me finish, right? Because I know this, okay? Because you said you were a hooker. She's like, no. Immediately, you go to give me your purse and your phone. Well, I knew she wasn't going to get out. She wasn't, I mean, gonna, she wasn't going to survive that encounter, was she? No. Because you can't rape her and let her live, can you? And she I can't mean, make a phone call if I you have it. I wasn't going to rape her. Well, you can't let her live. Edwin, we're missing something here, man. Look. Yeah, I know what you guys are thinking, and it makes perfect sense. It does. Because why would you ask? You why would you ask for her purse? What was in your head that made you want her purse? Because you know, just in case she had a gun, she had she, she could defend herself. Case she was gonna use her phone to call nine one one, call for help. So, help but listen to listen to this. According to your story, th this is where it does not make sense. If your intent isn't already there to do some kind of harm or some kind of evil to her, some friggin' evil that's there, bro. It's there. You just gotta face it down, man. You can't cower away from it. You face that damn thing down right now. If I you know the that. only way, if you don't have intent in her head, your thought is, I gotta keep that phone away from her because she's gonna call from help before anything bad's even happened. You've already made a decision. Am I right or am I wrong? Tell me. So, I made the decision that I to silence her, to kill her. I, let's be real. When you say yeah. silencer, you mean kill her. Is that correct? This time, the second detective took over, addressing the situation with a calmer demeanor, ensuring that the interrogation remained focused and productive despite the heightened emotions. Because when did you make that decision? When she started screaming. Because she had seen my face. But you already grabbed her phone. You already kept her away from making a call for help or contacting someone. So you're already preserving yourself. So I'm thinking it's before, when you ask for the purse, I think you already know in your head, I'm gonna silence her, I'm going to kill her. That, why else would you ask? So when she gave me her, like she had her phone, cause I knew her phone was back there. Like it, it just clicked on my head and I put her purse back there, her phone is in there. I know. <clears throat> so I told her, give me, give me the purse. So Tell she, me exactly how you said, give me your purse. <clears throat> Say exactly how you said it. Okay, so I went, give me your f***ing purse. Just like that. Just like that. Okay. So she hands over the purse, and I'm like, your phone is not in here. And she, is, she goes, yes, it is. So I start digging in the purse with this hand, and I find the phone, and it's there. So, and, you know, very relieved. But at this time, she's struggling with the door, and I'm, and I'm telling her, shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up. The detectives were aware that, despite Edwin's crimes, he still cared about his reputation and how others perceived him. They decided to exploit this vulnerability, using it as a strategic leverage against him during the interrogation. So, when I picked her up, because you know, usually when we help someone, we call it on the radio. Did you call it on the radio? No, because I thought she was over. That's why I didn't call her on the radio. That's why I didn't call her on the radio. And when I realized she was an author, I felt discovered. Oh, crap. You know, now she's gonna go tell the whole world that I was looking for s. Oh, wow, how weird would that be for a dude to be looking for s? See what I'm saying? And that's not that's not that bad. Dudes look for s. Dudes look for s. Well, yeah, but not a security guard that is supposed to protect. Well, I think you just said it, man. Another random dude walking on the street. So are we lucky in the fact that the first time you can't control your urge to have sex 
for the beautiful woman that we catch you and you give up and we find you, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> I don't believe so. I believe there's been instances in the past and maybe you were close, something new was happened. Well, maybe something's going to happen here and you backed away, whatever. Has there ever been time like that? A few days after Edwin's confession, Kaylee's parents were devastated to learn the grim details. Just to again, be able to hang your hat on something that you, something positive that come from this, from the murder of your daughter, um, rather than nothing, which most people get nothing. You just have to deal with the loss. Throughout the trial, Kaylee's grandfather solemnly expressed to the court that he had three wishes close to his heart. Number one, to have our Kaylee back with us, alive and well and pursuing her life. Number two, I'd wish to have this piece of garbage, the defendant, sentenced to death for what he's done to my Kaylee. And number three, I wish the court system and the state of Oregon would just hand him over to me and allow me to administer the death sentence. The love is beyond comprehensive depths. My life would gladly never be the same. I would have moved the moon, the moon and the stars for her. My purpose and joy in life was being her father, teaching her, protecting her. She was my little blondie growing up. <laughs> Later in life, I would get a spark of joy every time I would see her number pop up on my phone. To get a hug from her, to smell her hair, kiss her soft cheek, melted my heart. She gave me three significant intangible assets that are dear to me and I will try to do the best and live out and honor her by. She admired and respected our generosity, forgiveness, and much to my satisfaction, frequently told her boyfriend and others that my dad can do anything. This generally happened when she needed help with something mechanical and promptly told her boyfriend he didn't know what he was doing. Now we get to my next purpose in life. To honor my daughter and to help others so these events can't be played out again by another violent individual. Campus security officers are entrusted to keep our most valuable assets safe, our children. This college failed our daughter and put a sociopathic individual in a trusted position with little safeguards to assure his behavior on the job was appropriate. People with violent tendencies and sociopaths, correctly termed antisocial personality disorders, can be hard to pick out, but with proper hiring practices for these positions of great test, they should be easier to identify. And if one does slip through the cracks, there should be policies and procedures keeping the criminally minded from acting out their violent intentions. Adding to the horror of the situation, it was revealed that Edwin had a previous criminal history. He had been involved in carjacking a vehicle and a shooting incident in California. Initially, Edwin pleaded not guilty, but as the trial went on, he ultimately pleaded guilty to the charges related to the abduction, assault, and tragic murder of Kaylee Sawyer to escape the death penalty. However, he was found guilty. Consequently, he received a life sentence behind bars with no chance of parole. Right now, he's in, the, he's in the state of California on a no-bail situation where unless, unless that no-bail is released or unchanged, uh, he's not leaving our jail. But in a way, it has brought her back to me. You know, I, everybody that had a hand or a role in this horrible thing that happened to her has been punished. And I finally feel that I'm able to grieve my daughter, the loss of my daughter, and that she gets to drop that tag of Kaylee, the murder victim. You know, I, I would like to see COCC campus security really look like campus security. You know, I, I know that they've made many changes, you know, with that, but I do hear from people that, you know, they still feel that that environment is, is still there. Thanks for your attention to our story. The goal of Untold Crime is to share the most impactful stories with the world.